The Spectre. Part 10. The Ballad of the Damned. Saturday, October 31st, 1998. I woke up around 9 a.m. to the sound of the phone ringing, but I ignored it, falling back asleep. I woke up again around 11 a.m. to the same thing, but again, I fell back asleep. Around 1 p.m., I got up, and as I did, the phone rang again. I made my way to the kitchen and picked it up. Hello, I said. It's about time you got up. You had us worried, a voice said back. Sorry, Dad, I replied. How's she doing, I asked. Well, it's not good, son, he said. Her heart rate keeps spiking up and down, then up and down, and the doctors say it's like she's doing full sprints then stopping over and over again. They said they've never seen anything like this. I I think you should come down here, he said. Yeah, Dad, I'll come down. Let me call Jen to see if she can give me a ride. Are you okay, son? he asked. Yeah, Dad, just worried, I said back. I am too, he replied. When do you think you'll be able to get here, he asked. Let me hop in the shower and get dressed. Maybe an hour, hour and a half, I said back. Okay, son, your mom and I really need to get back to work. Our bosses said it's fine, but, you know, bills don't stop. I know, Dad, I said back. Be careful, son. I love you. I love you too, Dad. I hung up the phone and made my way back into my room. I grabbed a black shirt from my closet and a pair of black jeans, along with a black hoodie. I threw the hoodie and the clothes onto my bed. I walked out of my room and made my way down the hall. When I got to the bathroom, I brushed my teeth, then jumped in the shower, showering myself off for what may be the last time. I finished up and shut it off, grabbing my towel off the rack. I dried myself off and walked back into my room. I pulled out a pair of boxers from my drawers and put them on, letting the towel fall to the floor. I put my jeans on, then my shirt. I slipped my deodorant stick under my shirt and applied it, then finished it off with a spray of CK1 cologne. I sat on my bed and slipped a pair of shoes on. I tied them up, and when I finished, I heard a knock at the door. I stood up and walked out of my room, turning right down the hallway. When I got to the front door, I looked through the peephole. It was Jen. I grabbed the door lock and turned it, hearing it click as it unlocked. I turned the knob and opened the door. Jen was standing there in her skinny jeans and a brown hoodie, holding a bouquet of flowers. My mom bought these yesterday. I guess she had heard about Holly, Jen said. Thank you. I was actually getting dressed to go over there to see her now. I was going to message you and see if you would give me a ride, I said back. Of course, she said. Before we go, though, I need to talk to you. She walked in the house and into the living room. I shut the door, locking it behind me, and followed behind her into the living room. Jen stood in the middle of the living room, her head facing down, facing away from me. What's up, Jen? I asked. She turned around and looked up at me. Mark, before we go through with this, I have to ask, did you mean it? She asked. Mean what? I said back. Do you actually love me? She asked. I looked at her, puzzled. If you didn't, it's okay. I just, you know, with what happened at Callaway and all of this, I, I walked over to her, wrapped my arms around her waist, and pulled her in, kissing her soft, warm lips. As I did this, her hands wrapped around my head, and I felt her lean into me. I held the kiss for a moment, then let it go. Does that answer your question? I asked. She smiled and kissed me again. After which, she asked, Do you have your sentimental item? Not yet, I replied. I let go of her. I guess, I guess I need to find that, huh? Probably, she said back. We turned away and walked towards my room making our way down the hall and inside of it. I looked around for a second, taking it all in. Well, Jen said. What is it? she asked. 
standing next to me and staring alongside me now. I paused for a minute. I'm not much of a sentimental person, so I really had no idea what it would be. Jen went and sat on my bed and grabbed a book, still open to the same page it was open to last night, with a note stuck in it. I got it, I said. I turned around and walked down the hallway to Shane's room. I opened the door to the room, still a mess from the events of the other day. I walked up to Shane's desk and pulled the drawer open. Sitting on top of a bunch of papers and other random items was the yellow envelope I had discovered the other day. I opened it to find the birthday card, the $10 bill, and lastly, the picture of Holly, Shane, and I, with that creep standing behind Shane. I stared at the picture for a moment, thinking back on all the times we had spent together. The birthdays, the Halloweens, the Christmas mornings. I felt a tear start to build up in my left eye. I sucked it up and said, this one's for you, bro. I pushed the card and the money back into the envelope and placed it back into the drawers, shutting it behind me. I walked out of Shane's room and back down the hallway, rounding the corner into my room. Before entering, I slipped the picture into my pocket. Did you find it? Jen asked. Yeah, I got it. I said back. Did you get yours? I asked. Yeah, it's in my bag in the car, she said back. What did the note say? I asked her. Nothing, Jen replied. It was blank. We should probably get to the hospital, I said. Jen stood up and wrapped her arms around me. I'm going to miss this, she said, letting go of me. Me too, but we still have today. We looked at each other, and then I grabbed the book off the bed and stuffed it into my bag. I slung it over my shoulder, and we made our way out of my room. I flicked the lights off and looked back, realizing this was probably the last time I'll be in here. I turned and followed behind Jen to the front door. She walked into the living room, and picked up the flowers off the coffee table, then walked up to me. Ready when you are, she said. I unlocked the door and opened it for her. Ladies first, I said. She smiled and walked through the now open door. I followed behind, locking the door behind me. We walked through the damp, overgrown grass towards her mom's car. Do you think your mom is ever going to need her car anytime soon? I asked as we stood at the doors. No, well, probably not. She doesn't work, Jen said. Oh, I said back. She unlocked the doors and I set my bag in the back seat. I then opened the passenger side door and got inside. Jen got in and handed me the flowers. Hold these, she said as she sat down into the seat. She stuck the key into the ignition and we started the car. It was silent and the sounds of rain started hitting the windshield. She shifted the car into drive and pulled away from the curb. The clock on the dash said 2.20 p.m. We pulled into the hospital parking lot the same way we did yesterday. Jen found a spot and pulled the Volvo in. We exited the car and made our way inside, passing the front desk and arriving at the elevator. I clicked the up button and soon we heard the ding and the doors opening to the left of us. A couple people got off and made their way into the lobby while we boarded. I clicked the button labeled three and the door shut, slowly lifting us up. When we heard the ding again, we exited the elevator. We walked down the hallway, passing nurses and other doors until we got to room 311. I opened the door and Jen made her way inside. I followed behind. When we got in the room, I saw my father, but my mother was nowhere to be found. Hey dad. I said to him, and he looked over. Hey, Mark. Hey, Jen, he said back. I must go. I got a call saying they needed me at work. Your mom will be back in a bit. Can you sit with Holly and call me if anything pops up? I'll have my cell with me. Sure, Dad, but we have some plans this afternoon, you know, with it being Halloween. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Well, you kids have fun and let me know if you need anything. Will do, I said back. My dad took his coat off the chair and made his way out the door. I looked up at the clock on the wall. It read 2.50 p.m. Hey, Mark, I saw a vending machine up the hall. I'm kind of thirsty. Do you want anything? Jen said. 
I'll take a soda, a Coke if they have it, I said back. Okay, she said and made her way out of the room. I walked over to Holly, who lay just like she did yesterday, hooked up to several different machines. I took a seat next to her and took her hand into mine. Holly, I don't know if you can hear me, but I just wanted you to know I'm here. I squeezed her hand and felt nothing in return. Holly, I'm going to fix this, but in order to do so, this may be the last time I get to see you. I saw the heart rate monitor start to spike. Holly, if you can hear me, give me a sign, I asked, but the heart rate monitor stayed the same and continued beeping. Holly, I I love you, I said and let go of her hand. Jen came in and sat down in the chair where my parents slept yesterday. I went over and joined her. Here, Jen said and handed me a cold can of Coke. I popped the top, I held the can up to my mouth and took a swig, the carbonation hitting my tongue and the taste sweeping into my taste buds. So, when are we going to Hyde Park? Jen asked. Shortly. I just wanted to spend some time here, just in case. I looked at Jen and she leaned her head against my shoulder and I wrapped my arm over her. We sat there for a while listening to the heart rate monitor beeping and the sounds of footsteps walking on the other side of the door. A nurse came in a little while ago, just making the rounds. By this point, Jen had fallen asleep, leaning her head against the pillow that the staff provided my parents. I stood up, ensuring I didn't wake Jen, and slowly made my way out of the room. I turned back down the hall and made my way to the men's room. After using the restroom, I walked over to the sink, flipping on the water, and running my hand underneath it, interweaving my hands like an art form. I hit the soap dispenser and it let out a dollop of soap, white foamy soap. I rubbed my hands together and ran them back under the water. When I finished, I reached to the towel dispenser and grabbed a piece of brown paper towels neatly stacked on a shelf that sat above the sink. I dried my hands and looked at myself in the mirror. I took a deep breath and looked down again at the floor. I knew it needed to be done, but did I have the mind to do it? I mean, what if it doesn't work and something happens to Holly? No, I can't think that way. I must keep my eyes on what's ahead. I looked up, looking at my reflection again. But suddenly, behind me, it was him, waving in the mirror. Tonight's the night, Marky. Remember what I told you. Burn the book or watch your friends die. Time's running out, bitch boy. You know what? I said as I turned around, but nothing was there. Just the white wall and a poster about hand washing. The specter was gone. I looked back into the mirror and saw the same thing. White walls and the poster. I walked out of the bathroom, hitting the door hard as I left and made my way back down the hall. I opened the door to room 311 and saw Jen still asleep on the couch. I walked back over to the chair next to Holly and sat down. I placed my hand onto hers. I looked down, then at the clock, 4.15 p.m. I knew it would be getting dark soon. Holly, I said quietly, I have to get going now. I love you, and no matter what happens tonight, I'll always be here to protect you. I took her hand into mine, and looked down, fighting back tears, knowing that this would be the last time I would see her, thinking about what will happen once I'm gone. I love you, Holly. I stood up, still holding her hand. I looked at her, the monitor still beeping. I love you, I said as I lowered her hand gently back towards the bed. Suddenly, I felt a slight squeeze in my hand. I looked up. She still laid there motionless. Holly? I exclaimed, loud enough to wake Jen up. She sat up. She squeezed my hand, Jen. She can hear me, I said as tears began to fill my eyes. Jen rushed over and stood by my side. She placed her hand on the small of my back. Holly, it's Jen. If you can hear me, do this again. Squeeze his hand again, Jen said. Then... Like clockwork, I felt a 
Another small squeeze in my hand. Holly, fight this. Fight this thing. Don't let it win. We are fighting for you too, Jen said. Holly, I'm going to make this better, I said to her. I let go of her hand and looked back at the wall. The clock now read 4.17 p.m. We have to get going, Holly. I love you. And we'll beat this thing. For you, I said to her. I felt Jen pat the small of my back gently. I walked towards the door. Jen walked over to the couch and grabbed her keys, meeting me at the door. I looked back and then at Jen. She then opened the door and we stepped out. We made our way back down the hallway, walking side by side. When we got to the elevator, I clicked the down button and a moment later, the doors opened and we stepped inside. I clicked the button labeled one and the doors shut. The elevator took us down, and when they opened, we made our way out of the lobby and into the parking lot. The rain now falling lightly, we got to the car. Jen unlocked it, and we opened the doors. I sat in, and so did she. We closed the door at the same time. She stuck the key in the ignition and started the car. I looked down and flipped the radio on. It was quiet at first, then a drum beat started pounding away and a familiar vocal came through. Too alarming now to talk about. Take your pictures down and shake it out. Truth or consequence, say it aloud. Use that evidence, race it around. There goes my hero. Watch him as he goes. Jen shifted the car into drive. The clock on the dash said 4.27 p.m., and we took off towards Hyde Park. We got there around 4.50 p.m., traffic being a little bit heavier this evening. Jen pulled up next to Adam's Jeep. We got out, and so did Adam and Johnny. I opened the door to the back seat and pulled out my bag. We met at the back of the car. So, we're really doing this? Johnny said. I looked at him, then walked over to him. I stopped and then hugged him. I love you, dude, I said to him then broke the embrace. I looked at Adam, walked over to him, and did the same. I brought this just in case, Adam said, then opened the trunk to his Jeep. He reached in and pulled out a large cast iron stove. Did you guys bring your sentimental item? Jen asked. They both nodded their heads. All right, let's get out there, Adam said. We both turned and looked at the woods. The park now lay dark with only the glow of the park lights casting their light into the misty fog. We made our way onto the path and walked toward the tree line. Here, Jen said as she handed Adam, Johnny, and I a flashlight. I clicked mine on and so did they. When we got to the tree line, we stopped for a moment, looked at each other, and made our way in. The cracking of branches as we stepped in, followed by a slight rustle of the trees. Nobody spoke. We just continued forward, looking out for fallen limbs or worse. We walked and walked until we came to a familiar clearing. It's just up ahead, I said and pointed towards the right. We made our way in that direction, stepping over down limbs, crunching through the wooded floor that was covered in fresh autumn leaves. We walked another quarter mile until we found the spot the ground still disturbed from where I fell the other night. This is it, I said with a shake in my voice. We gathered in a circle, and Adam set the pot down on the ground. He took off the lid and set it next to the pot. Inside, he had placed some dried wood along with a fire starter. He looked up at me and asked, You sure you want to do this? I paused for a moment, looked around at everyone, and nodded my head. Yes, I said. Let's do this. Adam reached into his pocket and pulled out a lighter. He picked up the kindling and said, Before I light this, does anyone want to say anything? We looked at each other, then back at Adam. I stepped forward. Earlier this week, we were all strangers. Well, except Johnny and me. Now we're taking on an evil entity. No matter what happens tonight, just know, I always appreciate everything you guys have done for me. Jen, I've known you for five days. 
And in those five days, you have done more for me than my own parents have. I love you, and I'll always be thankful for you. Adam, I would have never thought that you and I would become friends. The way you stuck up for me until now. Everything. Thank you. Johnny, it's been a hell of a ride. From middle school to today, you've always had my back. I love you, bro. I love you too, bro. Let's kick some specter ass, Johnny said. We all chuckled in a way that only Johnny knew how to make us do. Adam flicked the lighter and set it to the kindling, lighting it to flames, then dropped it in the pot. I removed the book, and Adam pulled out the ritual instructions. First, we must offer our items, Adam set out. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a baseball card. This is a baseball card I got on my birthday when I was 10. It's signed by Mickey Mantle. I have cherished this card for years, but tonight I sacrificed this piece of me. He then dropped the card into the fire. He then looked at Johnny. Johnny reached into his pocket and pulled out two ticket stubs. These are the tickets from when my dad took Mark and I to see Green Day. It was a night that I'll never forget because I got to see one of my favorite bands with one of my best friends. Tonight, I sacrificed this piece of me. Johnny dropped the tickets into the fire, then turned to Jen. Jen reached into her pocket and pulled out a note. This was a letter I received from my grandmother. It said that she loved me and that she was proud of me for choosing to transfer schools and to get myself back on track. She passed shortly after she wrote me this letter. And it's something I swore I would always hold on to. But tonight, I sacrificed this piece of me. Jen then dropped the note into the fire and turned towards me. I reached into my pocket. This was the last photograph that was taken with all of us together. Shane, Holly, and me. If I knew this would have been the last time we would have taken our photo, I would have smiled. But I know Shane is out there, watching over us. I know he would have been proud of me, and I know he is. He's the best older brother I could have ever asked for, and I miss him a lot. I love you, bro. Tonight, I sacrifice this piece of me. I kneeled down and dropped the picture into the fire. With the final sacrifice made, everyone except the damned must join hands and summon the specter. When the specter appears, that's when Mark got it, I said. Jen, Johnny, and Adam gathered around the fire and sat down. Once they did, they all joined hands. I reached into my pocket and pulled out my knife. You ready, Mark? Adam asked. Ready as I'll ever be, I replied. All right, guys, repeat after me. Specter near, specter far. Spectre here, Spectre appear, Adam said. Spectre near, Spectre far. Spectre here, Spectre appear, they started chanting. Spectre near, Spectre far. Spectre here, Spectre appear, their chants echoing into the night. I looked around, waiting for it to appear, but had not seen anything yet. They continued chanting. Spectre near, Spectre far. Spectre here, Spectre appear, their chants growing louder and louder. Spectre near, Spectre far, Spectre here, Spectre appear, Spectre near, Spectre far, Spectre here, Spectre appear. Suddenly, I felt the force of energy knock me onto my face, like something came up behind me and pushed me down, like a freight train hitting me. I fell to the forest floor, the book went flying, and so did the knife. Jen, Johnny, and Adam stopped chanting. I looked in the direction where the force came from, and one of them shined a light. What I saw, I was not expecting. It was Derek. What are you queers doing out here, summoning ghouls or something? Derek, what the hell, Adam shouted. Adam, what are you doing out here? Did these freaks put you up to this? You know, Coach is pissed you missed practice all week. He was talking about keeping you, but I told him you were worthless. 
and he should cut you. Derek took a swig from a bottle. It's clear it, that it's not his first one tonight. Derek, you need to get out of here right now, I said to him, standing back up on my feet. Or else what? Your little spell won't work? I saw the cars in the parking lot and knew you fags would be out here. I thought you would be doing something with her, but I see I was wrong, he said back to me. Shut up, Derek, and leave now, I said more sternly now. How about you come make me, faggot, he slurred back. Without thinking, I ran at him as fast as I could. I dropped my shoulder and he caught me. He put his arm over the back of my head and held me under his arm. You want to fucking fight me, bitch? You're a coward, just like your loser brother was. And your lame-ass dad, he shouted at me. He then struck me in the stomach with his knee, knocking all the air out of my lungs. He did this again, and I heard Jen scream, Let him go! What, do you want some too? Don't worry. I know all about you, Jen. I have a friend at Callaway who said you'll open your legs for anyone, he shouted at Jen. I felt a rush run through my body. Angered, I elbowed Derek in the chest as hard as I could. He let out a gasp and unlocked my head from his arms. I stood up, and with all the force I had, I pushed him back. His leg caught on a branch, and he started to fall. Except, he didn't fall. He was suspended in midair. What the fuck? Who's holding on to me? Let me go, he shouted. Sure, an unfamiliar voice said. I looked back at the group standing by the fire, then back at Derek. Suddenly, we saw teeth, followed by piercingly red eyes. It's him, I shouted, stumbling backwards. I don't know who you are, but you're going to fucking pay, Derek shouted at it. Oh, so are you, boy, the specter said back. Then it opened its mouth and bit into Derek's shoulder, cracking bone as blood shot out of his flesh wound. Derek screamed in agony while this thing gripped its hand around its neck. Help me, he shouted at us, but there was nothing we could do. I started to back up and fell back onto my back. What are you guys waiting for? Do something, Derek shouted. I started scooting myself back until I felt my hand hit the book. I grabbed it and continued scooting back. Do, do, do some, Derek said, his breath becoming more and more shallow. I got up and looked at the specter. Let him go, I shouted. The specter unclenched his jaw and looked up at us with all of our flashlights pointed at him, its teeth stained red with fresh blood. He dropped Derek to the forest floor. So, I see you failed to heed my warning, boy, it said to us. Well, as much as I like Holly, it seems like her time has come, and so will yours. The specter stood up tall and started approaching us, slowly and menacingly. We all backed up behind the fire, which it now stood about 15 feet away from. Mark! Do it! Mark! Johnny screamed. Jen backed behind all of us. The specter still walking towards us. Mark! The book! Burn it! She exclaimed. Oh, it's too late for that, dearie. He had his chance, it said, now only about ten feet away. I opened the book, hoping I could do anything. I flipped to the first page. The note still stuck there. I pulled the note out, but my hands were trembling. I couldn't focus. I felt my heart beating a million miles an hour and a bead of sweat rolling down my forehead. The specter, now closing the gap, stood about five feet from the fire, still strolling still eyes locked, and teeth out. Give up, boy, it's time to go. I stepped back, tripping over a branch and falling onto my rear. The book flew and landed just in front of the fire, but I still had the note. I felt a hopelessness rush through my body. Johnny, Adam, and Jen kept moving back. The specter stopped and stared. Foolish beings, 
always thinking they can defeat me. But I live. I always live. Give in to your fear, boy. There is no point in trying anymore, it said. I looked back. Adam, Jen, and Johnny, they were terrified. I looked forward and saw the specter now hovering over me to my right, the fire to my left. I put my hands up, knowing it has got me, knowing that this was it, that we failed, that Holly was going to be next and soon the town would fall. The light from the fire shined off the note. In its glare, I could see, I could see writing. A sentence, something we hadn't seen before. I felt its hand grab my leg and begin to lift me up. I felt the ground, the sticks and things rubbing against me as it slowly raised me up, like a hunter who's got its prey. The light shines through the note, and I began to see my life flash before my eyes. I saw Shane and I riding bikes as kids. I saw us meeting Holly when she was a baby. I saw my 15th birthday party when Shane gave me his old skateboard. I looked up and saw its grin widen. Your time has come, boy. Prepare to spend eternity with me. But oh, don't you worry. You'll be seeing your friends again really soon. Its mouth opened. I looked at the note, focusing my eyes on the words. Suddenly, they became clear. Like they had been burned bright red into my mind. Like they were being written before my eyes in the light of the flame. The specter growled and I heard Jen let out a shriek. Mark, she yelled. I started shouting the words from the sheet. I am the damned, the one you seek. Be gone, Spectre, back to hell. I send you. This is your defeat. No, the Spectre shouted, dropping me back down to the forest floor. I looked at the note as the being began to back up. More words began appearing above what I said. The words for Mark and Holly, appeared suddenly. I shouted again. I am the damned, the one you seek. Be gone, Spectre. Back to hell I send you. This is your defeat. Shut up! You can't! The Spectre shouted. I am the damned, the one you seek. Be gone, Spectre. Back to hell I send you. This is your defeat! I said again. Then Jen, Johnny, and Adam stepped forward. I am the damned, the one you seek. Be gone, Spectre. Back to hell I send you. This is your defeat. We all began shouting as we joined hand and approached the being. You foolish mortals, stop at once. Stop, we continued. I am the damned, the one you seek. Be gone, Spectre. Back to hell I send you. This is your defeat. I looked over and saw Derek standing now holding his right shoulder, eyes wide. He began running away, shouting, Help! as he did. We were about five feet from the specter now, our chants becoming louder, like we were trying to wake up the devil himself. I am the damned, the one you seek. Be gone, specter. Back to hell I send you. This is your defeat, we called out. I will kill you all. I will hunt you for all eternity, it said. But our voices, as loud as we could get, we screamed, I am the damned, the one you seek. Be gone, Spectre. Back to hell I send you. This is your defeat. Suddenly, the fire shot up 30 feet into the air. No, I can't go back. Stop, you fuckers. I'm not going back, the Spectre shouted as it laid on the forest floor. We stood over him like he had done to us. We stopped chanting as we looked down at him. For the Johnstons. For the other families you destroyed. For the lives you have selfishly taken. For Holly. And for Shane, I said, looking into its dark eyes, a tear falling down my face, as Jen, Johnny, and Adam stood behind me. I am the damned, the one you seek. Be gone, Spectre. Back to hell I send you. This is your defeat. Suddenly, the fire, still blazing tall, crackling into the night sky, lit off a red haze, and like a hand reaching out, the fire wrapped itself around the specter, 
like chains around a fence, locking him in. I will torment you all, it said. I swear I will, its voice choked up, letting out a grunt as the fire around him tightened. Its red eyes squinched in pain. Then the fire dragged him closer to it. The specter tried to fight it, but the force was too strong. It pulled the specter in, and with an orange glow, we heard it shout, I will come back for it! Then it vanished. The fire shot straight up into the sky, then down forcefully into the pot, and suddenly the fire disappeared, leaving nothing but ash. Guys, did we... Did we do it? Johnny asked with a twinge of excitement in his voice. Jen took her flashlight and walked over to the pot, pointing the light inside. It's gone, she said as a smile began to form on her face. Oh my god, we fucking did it! Mark, we did it! Adam began shouting. I looked at them and started walking over towards them, stuffing the note into my pocket. Their cheers echoed through the woods. As I began walking, I felt uneasy, like all the energy in my body was suddenly sucked out. I began to feel dizzy, dropping my flashlight. Their voices now sounded blurred, like I was hearing them through a wall. I stumbled and fell to one knee. My eyes felt heavy, and the world was now spinning. Mark? Mark! I heard a voice call out, but couldn't tell who it was. My eyes got very heavy. I fell to the forest floor. I felt a hand reach under me and roll me over to my side. The voices I once heard were now more muddled than before. Then I felt the world fade around me. I felt all feeling go away, and the voices went silent. Is this the end? I thought. Then everything went to black. Sunday, November 1st, 1998. Beep, beep, beep. My alarm clock sounded out. I shot up, somehow laying in my bed and felt a hand on my back. Mark! Guys, he's awake! A voice called out. I looked down behind me and it was Jen. Jen? I said. I'm here, babe. Take it slow. What are we do? You had a long night. We got you home around midnight. Adam and Johnny had to take turns carrying you out. Did we... Did we... I tried to say, but still felt disoriented. Mark, we did it, she said. We beat it. I looked at her. Her hair was a mess, and her big brown eyes looked into mine. I looked over, then back at her. I started to chuckle with excitement. Jen took her hand and placed it under my chin. She pulled me in, and she kissed me. Mark, Johnny said as him and Adam entered the room. He jumped into the bed between Jen and I and hugged me. Dude, you're disgusting. Get out of my bed, I said, smiling. He crawled out of the bed, and I sat up and looked at Adam. He smiled. I guess I owe you one, I said. Nah, man, let's call it even, he said back. I stood up, realizing I was still wearing the same outfit from yesterday. I hugged him, then sat back on my bed. It's over? I said, questioning everything. Yeah, babe, it's over. You did it. I looked at Jen, then back up at Adam and Johnny. No, I didn't. We did, I said. Hell yeah, we did, Johnny said in his usual sarcastic tone. We all chuckled. Oh, and by the way, you have another person who wants to see you, Jen said. Your mom called this morning. Holly is awake. They're holding her for observation, but she said she wanted to see you. Holly, sh she's okay? I said in shock. Yeah, they said around 8.30 last night she came too. She's supposed to come home today, but... They're not sure when. They're waiting on some labs to come back, but early signs show that she's fine. I felt my eyes begin to well up. Let's go see her, I said, then stood up. Do you want to change? Adam asked. No, I want to go see her as soon as possible, I said back. 
Well, let's go then, Adam said. We'll meet you guys up there. He then patted Johnny on the shoulder and both left the room. Jen sat up and slipped her shoes on. My mom must have been rattled when you answered the phone, I said to her. Maybe a little bit, but not too bad, she said back. Hey, Jen? She looked up. I pulled her in and fell back onto my bed. Mark, she said as her body, now on top of mine, smiling down at me. I ran my fingers through her hair, and she leaned down, kissing my lips. My hands wrapped around her waist. She broke the kiss. Marky, we have plenty of time for this later, and believe me, I'm coming to collect, but we have to go, she said. One more, I asked. She lowered her head and kissed me again. We then got up and left my room, walking down the hall and to the front door. I opened it and said, ladies first. She walked through, smiling at me. I walked out of the door, the sun shining bright today and no clouds in the sky, just a soft breeze making its way down Blaine Street. I dug my hand into my pocket and fished out my key, but that's not the only thing that came out. The note from last night was still in my pocket. I opened the note and what was written was not there last night. In place of the words last night, a new message read, You did it, Mark. I have to cross over now, but I'll always be looking out for you. Take care of this family and your newfound friends. I've got your back forever. I love you, little bro. Shane. I smiled, folded the note into a square, and put it back into my pocket. I heard Jen start the car behind me. Thank you, bro. I love you, too, I whispered, sticking the key into the door, turning it, and locking the door. I turned around and walked off the porch through the grass, which, for some reason, looks like it had a fresh cut to it. I looked over and saw Adam and Johnny in Adam's Jeep, laughing. I made my way to the passenger door, opened it, and got inside. I pulled the seatbelt over my chest and buckled it in. I looked over at Jen, who was now slipping on a pair of sunglasses. She looked at me, and a smile began to form across her face. She looked back at the road and checked the mirrors. She pulled away from the curb, and we made our way up Blaine Street a little ways, but slowed down when we were passing the Johnston's house. You know... A lot of people lost their lives this week. I just hope they're in a better place, Jen said. I looked up towards the sky, placing my hand in my pocket where the notes sat. They are. I know it, I said, then looked over at Jen, and she smiled at me. What? she asked with a sort of chuckle. I leaned over the center console and kissed her, taking my hand and gently pressing it up against her face. The car behind us started to hunk its horn. We broke the kiss and looked back to see Adam and Johnny laughing, smiling at us. Jen raised her hand and gave them the middle finger. This made their laughs grow almost hysterically. We looked back at each other, smiling ourselves, knowing that this week has been hard for all of us. We looked over at the Johnston's house one more time and then turned our attention back to the road. We continued forward until we got to the end of the street where Blaine and Travis intersected. Jen flipped on the blinker, waiting on traffic to pass. I looked down and saw the radio was turned down. I reached my hand out and flipped it on. In local news, the Downey police are still on the hunt for. Jen reached her hand out and clicked the CD button on the dash. The radio cut out, and after a few seconds, a familiar song came on. There goes my hero. Watch him as he goes. She turned on the Travis Street, then a few minutes later on the Main Street. We rode Main for a while, eventually turning into the hospital. Jen parked the car, and we both got out. Do you want us to come in with you? Adam asked. Give us a few, then come up, I replied. I looked at them, standing there, and I smiled. I love you guys. You guys are my hero, I said. They smiled and Jen kind of chuckled, knowing I was making a reference to a song that came on the radio on the way here. I turned and started walking towards the hospital. I got about 15 feet away from them when I heard Jen say out, There goes my hero, and he is anything but ordinary. I smiled and continued walking towards the hospital.
Monday, October 30th, 2000. A couple years have passed now. Holly was released from the hospital that day and returned home. She's still attending Downey High and will be graduating in a few months. She occasionally comes to visit from time to time. My parents still own that home on Blaine Street. After that week, something changed in our family. We all seemed to get closer. My dad took a promotion, a well-deserved one at that, and my mom was able to go back to staying home, something that she had always wanted. They have slowly been doing renovations, and the house looks really nice. They ended up converting Shane's old room into a craft room where my mom now spends a lot of her time doing what she loves. Hanging on the wall in there is a portrait of all of us together. I made sure to check the background the first time I saw it, but there is nothing back there, thankfully. Jen, Adam, and I all graduated from Downey High in June of 1999. Johnny graduated from Callaway on the same day. I guess I should mention that Derek didn't graduate from there either. I guess after he left that night, he was pulled over for speeding and ended up getting a DUI. I'm not sure what happened after that. The last I heard, he ended up moving out of town and nobody has heard much from him since. I guess those college offers didn't work out too well for him after his shoulder was, well, you know. I'm sure the charges didn't help him that much either. Adam and Johnny ended up getting an apartment right off campus. They're only five minutes from Berkeley, a college that we all now attend. One of our favorite classes so far has been Dr. Lyle's history courses. Adam has enjoyed it so much that he's decided to pursue a minor in history. Dr. Lyle has asked about the book, but to be honest, I don't know what happened to it. My guess is that it is still out there in the woods behind Hyde Park, along with the stove and the shards of our past. To be fair, after the specter disappeared and I passed out, the book was probably the least of their concern. Losing Shane was really hard for me, but in his absence, I found two new brothers, and Johnny and Adam. We still hang out on the weekends almost every weekend. We spend a lot of our nights playing Street Fighter. I, I don't know if Johnny knows that they have come out with new games since, but it makes him happy, and who's to take that from him? On bright sunny days, I still look up at the sky, and in a way, I feel like he's looking right back at me and smiling. I know he would have been so happy. Today marks four years since he passed, but I know he's in a better place now. I still carry his note around with me for luck because if it weren't for that, I don't know if I would be here. As for Jen and me, we've been doing well. We made our relationship official a few days after everything ended and are getting ready to celebrate two years together. We ended up finding a place by campus and we have been living together since starting college. I hate to say it because it sounds so cliche, but during my free time, I've been stopping by local jewelry stores. I don't know about you, but to me, any girl who would go into a fight like that with someone they knew for a week sounds like a keeper. She still likes to call me her hero. It has kind of become a running inside joke now. In reality, though, she's mine, and I love her. With all of her corny jokes, but it's the big brown eyes that do it for me. I find comfort in them whenever we look at each other like we did years ago. As for the murders, they never found the perpetrator, and the four of us know that they never will. They had a suspect, but ended up releasing them. Lack of evidence, I guess. Since that day, there have been no new murders in Downey, a fact that I hope remains true for years to come. They ended up cleaning up the Johnson's house, and they sold it to another family. Holly says they also have a son, but they seem like good people, according to her. I wish that they would have been saved from all of this, along with the 12 or 13 other people, but such is life. I know that nobody else will face the same fate as them. As for me, I never thought in my wildest dreams that this would happen, but here I am. Almost 20 years old, a college student, and like the three others that were there on that Halloween night in 1998, a survivor. No longer a loner, but a brother, a son, a friend and a boyfriend to a beautiful woman who would have guessed that an interaction on bus 279 two years ago would change the course of my life 
and really all of our lives forever. I still think about that week from time to time, especially this time of the year. But I know if it should ever come back, if it should ever turn its ugly head again, that I'm not alone. That we have the support from above, from the best older brother ever. I know I have three best friends that will back me up at a moment's notice. I know I'm ready to protect my town or any town if I'm called upon. And if the specter should ever come back with its sharp teeth and red eyes to prey on the living, I know that it should be afraid of me. Because like my brother and my grandmother, I am the damned. And I'll always be ready to cast it back to hell again.